and you're just like rotating. And I heard that the first thing you hear is your arm cracking on the camera. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to uh, the first of the year, the first uh, live Q&A for the folks here at Soulbound Studios of 2019. It's been a busy year. It has been. It's already been. Uh, there's been a lot going on. Um, welcome. Uh, if this is the first time you're joining us, or if you're watching us after the fact as a recording, uh, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. My name is Jeremy Walsh. I am the game director, creative director here at Soulbound Studios, working on Chronicles of Valyria, and I'm joined today by Adam Maxwell, lead designer, and Vi Alexander, designer and producer here at Soulbound Studios. So today, we are going to be fielding your questions as part of our Q&A. But since it's been a while since we've done one of these Q&As, uh, I thought we would spend some time just giving a quick update and make sure that everybody's caught up to where we are right now. Yeah, a lot has like happened that. in the last few months. Uh, a lot of changes, like, for good, yep. <laughs> uh, generally. And we've just been, like, laser-focused on working on some stuff that I, I don't even know where the time has gone. It's been crazy. Yeah. It's just one event, one, one thing going on after another. So many new features, uh, so many new things working. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about it. So first thing is, is kind of working from back to forward. Uh, we did have our State of Illyria a couple weeks ago. Uh, the State of Illyria, for those who are not following, is our semi-annual uh, update. I tend to do it about every year or every six months, depending upon what's going on at the company here. Uh, it's a, a blog post I do in order to make sure that people are kept up to date on kind of what's going on in the studio. Uh, and in this latest State of Illyria, we updated you on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we're in a new office space. Uh, you can't see it, uh, but if you go back and watch some of our old live streams, you'll notice that we are in a different yeah, setting now. We did. Yeah. Uh, and if you we didn't just reorganize the room. No, no, the <laughs> it's room, a new room. We could not have that room was too small it's to too do small. that in. Uh, so we're in a little bit bigger office space now. Um, the company is growing again, so we did need to relocate our office spaces, and this is our new soundstage. So uh, please enjoy that. Uh, if you want to see what our old office looked like as, after we moved out, uh, and kind of more about what our new office space looks like, go ahead and do check out the state of Illyria post uh, dated in February. It's on the chroniclesofillyria.com website. Just go ahead and look at our blog posts and you'll be able to find the state of Illyria there. So yeah. do check it out. And like moving into that old office space and then getting the new cubicles and getting it arranged how we want and getting it decorated how we want it is mm -hmm. all part of like even That's older That's like a previous state, state of Illyria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can see that whole process as we moved into out of my basement and into this massive office when there was just like four of us with these cubicles that were way too big for us because it was a call center. And then gradually we turned into a game studio. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first thing we talked about. The, the next thing we talked about, I think, was uh, a lot focused on um, Chronicles of Illyria. We actually focused a lot on what we're doing right now with our pre-alpha. So uh, if you hadn't gotten a chance to read the state of Illyria, or as a quick refresher, we're currently working on release 050 for Chronicles of Illyria, which is heavily focused on feature and gameplay integration from all of the work we've done in the past regarding various prototypes, primarily focused on uh, the adventuring mechanics. Right. So there's a lot there right now on combat. I would say I think it's one of the heaviest elements we're working on right now. There's archery, there is um, NPC interactions, world interaction, uh, working on AI right now. What else? Am I missing well, the anything? The story system. The story system. <laughs> Nothing, you know. <laughs> Nothing, Nothing major. You know. Uh, yeah, well, the scope of it is, you know, really focusing more around what the average adventurer does, which is kind of what most MMOs are all about. Sure. There are some elements of social mechanics and the, the R system for right. questing, which is really whether or not you feel the pull of, of fate at you, you mm -hmm. know, driving you towards completing certain objectives that you find out about in a more natural manner than, you know, like clicking on somebody who has an exclamation point above their name and right. just following the prompts. And a lot more based on knowledge. Knowledge yes. and observations, you know, things you've discovered or things you've learned or witnessed uh, plays, I think, a much larger role in what we're doing with our story and contract system than what you've seen really ever before. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. So lots of good mechanics going on right now. I know it's been a while since you guys have seen anything. Uh, we're kind of in the in the calm before the storm right now, which was actually the title of last State of the Illyria. Um, the calm before the storm right now just means that we're we're very focused, very heads down right now on working on gameplay mechanics. Uh, we're kind of in that pre-alpha phase where a lot of what we're working on is only being showed to our first tier backers, our alpha one backers, uh, and so we are actually since the beginning of the year, beginning of the year, giving them about every two weeks an update where we talk to them about what we're working on. We show them media, uh, animated gifs and videos from our latest sprint. Yep. Uh, and we're getting a lot of feedback from them right now. So I know you guys aren't seeing it right now. Uh, you guys will get to see it soon, but I just wanted to make sure you guys knew that there's a lot of progress happening right now. Things are coming along splendidly, uh, and people are very excited about it. Those who do get to see what we're looking at are being very helpful, and they're also very excited about what they see. Yeah, a so, lot of buzz in the early access forums. So that's great. Um, 
What else? Domain and settlement selection? Well, we did a couple events. Um, right. You know, so there were there were some opportunities to get some packages and win some potatoes, glowing potatoes right. and stuff. So, like um, some glow potato vodka. Exactly. Yeah, yeah so there's <clears throat> been some cool stuff going on, like, on the website. But the next thing that's coming up is domain and settlement selection, which is... Very soon. Big. And big. A lot of work there. Uh, before we talk about those, though, or more about domain settlement section, because I know there's a lot of questions on here. Uh, going back to the uh, Chronicles of Illyria subject, uh, we also did have some media in our state of Illyria. And just in case people didn't get a chance to see the state of Illyria yet, or if they're watching this on YouTube after the fact, why don't we take a look at some of the media? Q Media. Nice. So, so for those who don't know, uh, what you're actually looking at is our pre Lyria client, which uses uh, lower fidelity assets so that we can more rapidly iterate and prototype on mechanics without worrying about disrupting the content team. So if you are surprised by the art style, um, just be aware that it's just what we're doing for pre-alpha. Right, yeah. it's just a stepping stone to the, the final fidelity that we intend to have, but it's in Unreal, it's using all the same stuff. Um, it'll just be mostly an art swap later on. Right. A lot of games, actually, it's not uncommon for them to do a, a gray box cycle yeah. as of the early part of development. And in that gray box cycle, uh, what you do is you kind of hash out all of your different content, your maps, uh, any kind of procedural world you're doing, your gener world generation you're doing. Uh, but a lot of times you just use stubbed assets that are literally, quite literally, gray boxes. Uh, but we wanted something a little bit more than that. Because our world is so big uh, and our biomes and things, uh, we want them to look visually distinct. We actually started making this kind of low, low poly, low fidelity artwork so that we could actually get a better idea of what the world looked like than just gray boxes. Right. But it is really just kind of a, a work in progress. Uh, the mechanics, things like the archery that you look at or the combat or any of that stuff is all actual valid gameplay. It's the same systems that we're running uh, in Chronicles of Valyria. It's just using that kind of lower poly, lower fidelity art style right now as a stepping stone. Um, as we move out of pre-alpha into alpha one, one of the first things we're going to be doing is swapping these low, low poly, low fidelity assets with the higher fidelity assets that you are used to seeing from our previous screenshots and videos. Yeah, the, the visual aspects of the game are pretty important. We intend to have a lot of features that are designed around what you see is what you get. Right. Whether or not you're evaluating whether or not somebody's going to kick your ass or whether or not you're evaluating whether or not you want to uh, you know, eat that berry. Right. So there's a lot of visual cues that means that... Um, just straight gray boxing isn't quite suitable for where we are in development. Also, we want to get people into the game as early as possible, and there is a certain amount of um, visual fidelity and uh, a quality of assets that you want to include right. in order to make it something that is palatable, right. I suppose. We, we want to get you in as early as possible, but all you're going to look at is gray boxes. That's that's a little hard to swallow. It I is. mean, that was our plan originally. We want to get players in as early as we possibly could. Right. You know, even back to the point where there was just nothing, just walking and talking and being able to move around in the world. Well, the original plan that was, was the original just plan. a mud. Yeah, just a mud. <laughs> uh, just get everybody in, giving us feedback. Uh, but, you know, as we've been doing this, we've realized that there is something for showmanship as well. It's important to have something that looks and feels good. And, and as much as I want to bring people along through the entire journey, I, I think the best experience they can have is kind of somewhere between getting in early and being able to provide that meaning, meaningful feedback and then also having something to give meaningful feedback on. Right. You know, if there's nothing there for them to give feedback on, then it's just not useful for, for us and it's not enjoyable for them. Right. Well, and I think, you know, you guys touched on it, but feel is so important to the game that any lower fidelity than, than Preliria would just not get across what we right. wanted people to experience. Like, it wouldn't even be a valid test at that point. Right. Yes. Speaking of field, combat feels really good. We just had a review meeting yesterday, it's and there, we're man. signing off on some of our weapon sets, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, all right, uh, so then the other thing we talked about was domain and settlement selection. Yes. I know there's going to be a lot of questions on various things. There's actually a lot of design mechanics, which is why I wanted my lovely designers here uh, as the talent for today, so they can help me answer some of these questions. Um, but the first question is on domain and settlement selection. Yep. It was one of the big focuses that we've been working on. Uh, in fact, today, actually just last night, we released a new update to the website, which included some new features. So if you're watching this and haven't gone out to the website yet to check it out, uh, title transfers, 
the ability to take titles from your inventory that you have. You can now transfer them to other people who are your same uh, pledge tier level or below. So if you're a mayor, you can transfer excess, excess mayor titles to other mayors or to somebody who doesn't have a title. Yeah, share the love. Share the love. Um, and if you're a count or higher and you want to get rid of some of those titles that you might have accumulated over time, we had several Kickstarter anniversary events in the past where we gave people extra, you know, mayor titles, governor titles. You know, there was a count, some count titles we gave away. So any of those things, uh, if you have those in your inventory, it's now possible to transfer those to other people. They can claim them. Uh, they can rebundle titles if they need to in order to transfer those on. There's all kinds of stuff. So right now, here we are just before domain and settlement selection, and now all the titles and packages and people's inventories are starting to shake out. Yeah, and it's, it's very exciting now yeah. to see where things are going. So title transfers, uh, you can also trade in titles. There were many people who backed us early on, but uh, they did so at a high enough level that they would have gotten a mayor title or something, but didn't really want to play that role. But that was really the only way early on for them right. to support us. Uh, so now you can go head into your inventory, bundle those mayor titles up into a, a mayor title bundle, and then you can trade that in through the interface directly for additional EP so that you can kind of customize your experience uh, during exposition a little bit more. So Yeah, and then there's also uh, server selection, which has been available for a while now, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a prerequisite for being able to choose your domain in domain and settlement selection. Yep. So if you haven't chosen your primary server, or at least the server that you wish to have your titles and on. land on, right. yeah. Um, please go to the website and, and do that because it is going to affect the, you know, the order of operations. Of, oh, I will everything. underscore that because yeah. there is a hard requirement. We do not want people coming into domain and settlement selection, looking at the state of a server and deciding that they don't want to be on that server because it doesn't look like what they wanted. You know, for example, let's say I want to be the Duke of a Grasslands uh, duchy, and I happen to come on to that server that I was planning to be on and all the grasslands are claimed. We don't want people jumping servers. Uh, for that reason, because you're going to end up with an inferior play experience on a server that's further away uh, because it doesn't have the biome you're looking for. And the game is more fluid than that, right? You can conquer, you can expand. So even if you don't begin in a grass line, that doesn't mean you can't end up there. And so we really want people to commit to their server first and then kind of work within the guidelines. You know, if I was sitting down to play a game of Risk, uh, I would sit down and then we would go through that early part where people are handing out their pieces and, and you know distributing them on the board. I don't get to go halfway into a couple different games in the middle of that process and then pick the one I think that's got right. the best opportunity for me. So for us, uh, server selection is a requirement to, to even begin domain and settlement selection. So we will be locking uh, people out at the beginning of domain and settlement selection who have not server locked at the beginning and you won't actually then be able to pick your title or your domain or settlement until the very end of domain and settlement selection. Yeah, so you effectively lose your, your place in place influence in order yeah. uh, if you haven't chosen or you haven't bound your titles and lands to a, server. a particular server. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can't play on another server with another character, right. but we do need to know what server your title and lands are going to go yep. on to. So please, please, please make sure before domain and settlement selection begins in April that you do go in and you bind those servers to your account. So yep. that, Don't you know, delay. Don't delay. Uh, and then the other thing is, is we've got a promotion going on right now. We do. Yes. So uh, we just launched our uh, Festival of Renewal for the second year in a row. There's some cool items on the store right now. A lot of orchards and kind of farm-related stuff going on. Um, and then last night we also rolled out one of our new promo items, which is the Tale of Two Hamlets. Kind of a tongue-in-cheek to the Dickens mm -hmm. novel. Uh, couple things to note. The Tale of Two Hamlets doesn't have to be a hamlet. Uh, it can That's be any... I, I know, right? Two settlers. Settlements. Yeah, you raised that issue. Yeah. The Tale of Two Hamlets can really be any settlement size. All that really does is it gives you a couple of the new mayor title bundles in your inventory that you can claim yourself, keep one and transfer the other to somebody else in order to create sister settlements. Or if you're a count, you can give both of them away to people who you want to be inside your county and allow them to participate in domain and settlement selection. Yeah. So it would be an influence order as usual, but it does give you an opportunity right before domain and settlement selection begins to go out and, and recruit, get some more mayors participating in domain and settlement selection because there are thousands and thousands of settlements out there, most of which are so unclaimed. Many. So many, so many settlements. Uh, so do do yourself a favor, do us a favor, share the knowledge, let people know that those uh, limited bundles are available right now before domain and settlement selection begins, and they just go out and, and get those mayors. You know, we want those people to pick the pick those settlements. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's kind of a, a recap on what's going on right now. Let's get to the questions. Let's get to the questions. So let's look at this. Uh, heads up. It's been so long since we did a, a Q&A uh, that I didn't do any kind of curating. We didn't do culling of, of much at all. Uh, there was a couple of questions we cut because... Uh, they were things that we felt like the general population mostly knew and would be able to answer without us. Um, there are some that we felt like was so far out into the future in terms of development that 
uh, we wouldn't be able to answer it effectively, and so we kind of cut those. But by and large, uh, we've just taken the questions that people have asked in, in order from highest rated to lowest rated, right. and we've taken about the top 25, and now we're going to work our way through them. So yep. we'll do the best to answer the ones we can. Yeah, why don't we have a... This guy reads Please, it, because your I'm, voice is a little... I'm yeah. sick, and yeah. my, I'm losing my voice already, so... All right. When you need to weigh in, you can I'm just done. <laughs> <laughs> Tarvald asks, well, with domain and settlement selection right around the corner, I'd personally like to hear a little bit more about the map. What can we expect to see? How can we expect the tool to work? Will we be able to see the map clearly, and will we have the ability to browse uh, all the way through to the end of domain and settlement selection? I understand some of this has been asked before, but with the event right here, I hope you'll consider going into a bit more depth. A fantastic question. I think we can go into more depth. And very tam timely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to achieve during domain and settlement selection is to marry the experience that players are going to have going in to select their domains with our cartography system. People are going to be able to make their own maps in-game, and we want it to be something that really people can, can become craftsmen at. And so there's different levels of quality of different maps and different types of symbols that you can put on there. And we also wanted to be inspired by, you know, Tolkien maps and other fantasy maps from, you know, like the the, the physical like cloth maps that you would get in some Absolutely. old game boxes or, you know, in front of your favorite novel, you know, there's a page that kind of like describes the map. So, I love those. Yeah. So we've kind of made our own style that is both something that reveals information about the terrain and the surrounding area, but also provides that sort of like fantasy feel, but in, in our style. So I think we even have a, a concept that we can show um, of the maps style that we're, uh, that we're working toward, which shows at, at the top there, there's uh, kind of the full continent and one, one of those, one server out there, you'll notice that that's your continent. Right. However, it, is, it, is <laughs> it is rotated, it is rotated. Also, also however, uh, internet sleuths, that is not real data on the map. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is a style concept. This isn't a, this isn't a literal, here's a preview of the map you're Yeah, you're not, you're not getting a, 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 like a several week drop of no, your... You'll, you'll see that when the event starts, right. but uh, you can see on the top one, there is the, the main starting continent, and it's got an, a border around it of one of the kingdoms that it could potentially have. And then the bottom left is a, more of a close-up at that kingdom level, and you'll notice there's a little bit more detail uh, then on the full continent level, the one in the middle at the bottom is then one duchy of that kingdom. Right. And then the one on the bottom right is one county within that duchy. So you can sort of see the levels of detail at each of those different levels. Obviously, players in game using the cartography system can map something as small as one settlement or one ruin or a cave or other things. They don't necessarily have to be at the, at the county level at the smallest. Right, that's just what domain and settlement right. selection is yep. using. And those are, that is fairly zoomed out too. Um, the, the kind of the, the, the level of detail and the information there is correct, but uh, players should keep in mind too that when we get into domain and settlement section, they will actually be able to view those significantly larger than what they're being shown at right, right. now. Right, it's not going to be a 1080p image. Yeah. It's going I think, to be significantly larger. Well, I yeah. think actually what it's designed is, is that uh, each kind of each level of zoom occupies a full standard like 960 by 960 screen. So if you're looking at the continent one at the top, you know, expect that to be, first of all, rotated correctly, but would fill, <laughs> that entire continent would basically fill your entire screen. Right. Uh, like Google then, Maps, you'll be yeah, able to like zoom in zoom to in. the appropriate level right. that you care about. So that county that you're looking at in the bottom right, uh, that would be expanded during the in the actual tools to make sure that it's filling the entire screen so that right. you can identify clearly the individual settlements inside the county and things like that. So yeah. and then certainly you'll be able be larger. to pan around and right. see, see what you want, see what's nearby. Um, you'll be able to click on each of the settlement icons that are on the screen to be able to view a few more details about it, things that will help you decide whether or not that's the settlement for you. Mm -hmm. All kinds of cool, fun information. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to the questions then. Indeed. All right. So the next question comes from Draguda, uh, who asks, how close are we to getting the farming and agriculture DJ that was mentioned over a year ago? Yeah, Max, how close are we? Will it be soon, or will it be <laughs> soon, soon trademark? Soon to him. Uh, I think it'll be soon. Um, I've been thinking that we were going to maybe put out another design journal in the next, like, 14 days. So. All right, well, there you go. Is it going to be on farming and agriculture, though? I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be. Yeah. We've got a few more design journals planned. We've been kind of heads down focusing on just getting some things spec'd out, getting some things implemented, getting some things prototyped, 
And I think for a lot of features that people have been highly anticipating at the at the adventure level, um, then there there is a lot more to say currently. Mm -hmm. And so we I think we want to say those things. So yep. expect some more design journals coming forth. Indeed. Soon. Soon. <laughs> uh, all right. So the next question comes from uh, Flynn Pontus, who says, in Atlas, when a server becomes overpopulated, random players would be kicked off of the server to make room for other people to log in. That's harsh. I know. Anyway, uh, how does SBS intend to deal with server overpopulation? Well, I can kind of touch on that a little bit. Um, you're, you're probably more I can, I can elaborate, than I. But, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, MMOs don't usually work that way. Um, there's a couple of different strategies in MMOs that sort of make sure that people are kind of diffused around the world so that they don't all gather in one place to sort of overload a server. And then we have strategies for when everybody does move into the same place, how you can sort of filter by what we call areas of concern so that it's more easy or it's easier for us to sort of only show you what matters to you so that we don't overwhelm your connection with with data, uh, making it possible to have more people in space than, say, an Atlas server or an Arc server or, or some other survival game server. Yeah. Um, I mean, in general, you're going to be in a settlement or around in the wilds, and there's going to be some stuff around you, and that's not really going to be a big deal. And everybody on that server who's like playing in that that version of Illyria is is on that version of Illyria, but it's subdivided in such a way that you don't have to worry about the draw calls and right. the population and the server load overall. And it's only when you have like pitched battles where there's potentially thousands of players all in one small area that we even kind of need to worry about the subdivision of, of people. Right. And uh, I mean, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong too, but we also are, our whole server backend sort of infrastructure is meant to be scalable and, and parallelizable. Yeah, so our backend infrastructure is not uh, segmented in, in static static quads or static sections. It's all flexible and dynamic. So uh, if people start to come into a, a, an area that becomes more and more populated, it can continue to subdivide the physics engine up for that, uh, such that uh, the services that are running you know, on multiple on the same machine or even running on different machines entirely uh, can handle the load of processing the physics and, and other things on that, uh, on that particular section, I'm trying not to use vocabulary that uh, we don't want to carry over, but uh, subdividing the, the world within that small area. The problem is, is that um, from the backend's perspective, we can continue to subdivide the world until you get so many uh, that the, actually the network bandwidth that you get is now the, the bottleneck. It's no longer about making sure that the CPUs can compute the, the collision and everything else. It's really just about the message handling. And at that point, you can't subdivide the world any further than that and still see any kind of positive gain. So then at that point, we have to use other tricks and tools in order to try and optimize how we handle execution at that kind of smaller scale. Um, and that's fine. Um, but then there's also the problem of the client. And that's actually one of the bigger problems for us right now because we can scale out horizontally as much as we need to. We can design mechanics that encourage people to spread out all over a very large world. Our starting continent is about uh, 96 kilometers by 192 kilometers square uh, as a bounding rectangle. So it's a big world, uh, and we, our, our design mechanics are, are such that it encourages people to spread out. But when they do come together like that, then obviously there's our backend's ability to process all those different characters and dynamic objects uh, inside of a single space, but then there's also the client themselves. And as, as Snipe Hunter was talking about, that's really when it's about making sure that you only see or only get notified about the things that you care about. Um, things like you know whether or not you're, there's people there who are of, of the same tribe as you, people who you've interacted with or messaged before, or somebody who's recently attacked you or you've attacked or you know if there's any kinds of hostilities between the tribes or nations you know we can use heuristics to help identify whether or not that's somebody that you would care about seeing or not mm -hmm. uh, as a way to make sure or just based on proximity you know as things get closer to you they become a higher area of concern as he was saying before so we can use all these different things to make sure that even if there are you know dozens or hundreds of people in your immediate area that you still only are only showing the, the number of them that really makes sense for what you would care about uh, up to the degree that your your graphics card and your CPU can handle it. And if it starts to get to a point where it can't, then we can scale back the number of objects that you're looking at in order to make sure that uh, you're able to continue to run smoothly. Yeah, I think there's a previous Q&A that we did maybe even a couple of years ago at this point that uh, covers a little bit more about um, battles mm -hmm. and, and how we, we expected those to 
occur and how it impacts the performance of the game. So definitely go back and, and look for that on our YouTube channel. Yep. Um, the, uh, the answer hasn't really changed. Like we, we, we are still intending to use the same type of subdivision, which can be parallelized across different servers. So we can just spin up more instances to handle the load. Um, so it shouldn't really be a big impact to the, uh, the player. And we're definitely not going to kick people off of like a continent or a world or something like that. There's no zones in Illyria, so we're not going to kick you into a new instance. Like that's just not really how this game works. Yep. Yeah. Cool. What do we got next? Thanks. You got the script. Yep. Hold on. I was wanted to say something to somebody. <laughs> uh, okay. So the next question comes from Scuttle, who says, since the scrapping of the patent system, is there any protection that a guild or other entity might have of, on the technology that they research? In the same vein, everybody asks compound questions. In the same vein, would it be possible to write a blueprint or a recipe in a cipher so that only the intended recipient would be able to read it? Huh. So that's clever, but it's no. It's a fascinating question. Yeah. Um, let me answer the first question, though, because that's actually, the, I think, the more important piece of what's being asked here. Um, so a big piece of the game is the the flow of knowledge throughout what your character knows what your your nation knows what your town knows all sort of affects the things that you can do in the world uh, and so we sort of decided that protecting that information is in and of itself an aspect of gameplay here in in chronicles Valyria. so when you make a breakthrough uh, and you discover a new blueprint or or unlock a new technique uh, you'll get the thing that you can use to, to teach that to somebody else, whether that's a blueprint or, you know, you've written down your findings in a codex or something like that. Um, it's on you to keep that safe as much as it's on, you know, a, a clever spy to try to figure out how to make a copy of that information and take it away from you. Yeah. That's the sort of like interplay and gameplay that allows trade based sort of PVP in things like industrial espionage and, and things like that. And we feel like that's a really important aspect of the world. Yeah. So we're not going to give you, um, an automatic, artificial yeah. protections. It's not going to be like free and automatic. It's something that you'll have to work with. Like right. you know, imagine back in like you know medieval Europe or something, or just medieval times in general. Like you had to work to protect state secrets uh, as well as technology, and you didn't want that to get necessarily into the hands of your enemy. And we don't want to rob you of that gameplay element because it will be interesting. Certainly, there's the possibility that a particular region could try to put some laws in place to provide protection but again that's another element of gameplay that players can um, create for themselves and then attempt to enforce for themselves all right next question is from countess countess says hello developers hello many of us are interested in gardening and landscaping for our estates what kind of gardening assets can we expect will we be able to grow hedges uh Technically, yeah. I mean, the, the, the way the farming system works, it, farming and gardening are the same thing mechanically for what it's worth. Um, the way the, the farming system works, any plant that you can harvest seeds or saplings from, you can plant and, and you can tend and, and you can grow. So if there is a bush that, that serves the same sort of function as a hedge, or if we literally have hedge bushes in the world, then you absolutely can grow them. Um, as for what sort of like gardening content you're going to see, um, most of the tools of the trade, you know, hose, trowels, uh, watering cans, um, even, you know, things like spades, sp spades. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say though, even things like, um, you know, uh, aphids that, uh, or not aphids, but ladybugs that you can use to deal with aphids rather. Um, the whole idea of the farming system is that as these plants grow, just like any sort of character in the world, their status changes based on local conditions, right? If they're not getting enough nutrients, they're not going to thrive and they'll begin to die. If they're not getting enough water, they'll sort of like brown out, dehydrate and, and start to die. And so as part of an aspect of that gameplay loop, it's on you to look at your plants, uh, interpret what you're seeing to understand what's going on, and then use the tools and techniques of farming to mitigate the soil, remove parasites, add the appropriate nutrients back in, uh, you know, water your plants, um, all of that kind of stuff. So the types of tools that you can expect are the types of tools that you would use in your regular day to day. We don't have, you know, garden hoses, but we do have pails and we do have watering cans. Um, I think the one question I have to follow up on that is can you make topiaries or hedge mages? Right. So that's the reason I was a little bit iffy about the question on hedges, because yep. we're not going to do 
uh, topiary sculpture, at least not at first. Um, it'd be kind of fun. I mean, we you do a sculpture research, mechanics. So research theory. that, and we could potentially uh, put that in. But it's launch. it's not something that we're worried about right now. It's not going to be a launch feature. Anyway. Yeah. At a high level, from from my perspective, uh, farming. I mean, really, all the mechanics. But farming is something that we want to be as interesting and as and exciting as engaging as combat or any of the crafting professions. I mean, we really try and make sure that each of the major skill areas, each of the major focus areas of the game, are things that are as interesting and as exciting as everything else. And so, I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, what are the traits and what are the personalities and what are the goal what are the goals of the person who wants to do farming? You know, they're looking for something that allows them to experiment. They're looking for the opportunity to play a vital role in society. They're looking for an opportunity to be a part of a larger ecosystem, whether or not that's a crafting ecosystem or an actual living ecosystem. And so all the mechanics that the designers are working with in terms of farming focus on fulfilling those obligations. So as an example, you know, we've we've talked in the past about crafting things like alchemy where you know you take or cooking you know let's say you take uh, something like a, an herb from your garden and you cut it up and you put it into a vial and you're trying to create some kind of tincture or something out of it as a result of the plant you know and in a lot of games that would be the end of the story you know you harvest the plant you put it into some water in a vial and you put it on uh, the beaker and it cooks it um, here you have to focus on things like you know what what were the nutrients that were used to make that plant because growing an herb in different soil environments might result in slightly different alchemical construction right, different properties different properties yeah. of it and so you know as a result of that the farmers then they have a, a purpose other than just providing food you know having the ability to understand the soil and how it contributes to not just the things that they're growing but ultimately the things that people are going to use those things for like cooking and alchemy and stuff like that it plays an important role in that. Um, and that's where the experimentation comes from. You know, you're going to have to learn what kind of properties the soils contribute to cooking and alchemy and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, things like rotating the fields and adding new plants to the ones that are already there can you can be used to change the soil composition, for example, or as you were saying, you know, repopulate the soil with, with um, things that it's missing, minerals and things that it's missing. So like that's a it's a very exciting system for me because I think that players uh, of MMOs are not used to this level of experimentation in something that's seemingly mundane like right. growing food. Uh, so, so so grass fed beef versus meal right. meal fed Absolutely. beef Absolutely. is, is gonna be matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Turgon then, our next question. Uh, Turgon asks Would we see Kippic architecture outside of the Ironwood Forest? I have a fair amount of Kippic players, and I'm located in the Shrub Step. Uh, any change of their architecture, uh, any chance, typo there, any chance of their architecture being applied to trees like bristlecone pines? Obviously at a much smaller scale and at the risk of being cut down. Uh, so you will see examples of Kippic architecture elsewhere. You're not going to see examples of their ironwood homes on anything other than ironwood trees, however. It's, it's worth noting that Kippic will also have the ability to build things on the ground. Um, there are a couple of examples of that in the lore already. Um, the Kippic have a university, for example, that is built on the ground. Um, so when you see Kippic who are not in the Ironwood Forest, more than likely if they're building their own structures, they'll be in the same Kippic style, but they'll be on the ground structures. They're not going to be little teeny tiny houses on a 10 foot tall tree or something right. in like their, that. Right. In their lodgings in the Ironwood Forest, they, may, they take advantage of features that don't exist in other forests. Exactly. So they would potentially be able to build something like off the ground, but it's going to require different materials, different properties, and different architecture for that. But the style could be still Kippic style. Exactly. Yeah. And in terms of the Kippic style, I think the Kippic in particular, the thing that we define about the Kippic is, is their lack of desire to harm their environment. You know, they, they want to live amongst the environment, so they build on top of the tree leaves, they, you know, they are inside of the, the, the mushrooms and things like that. They're, they really try to coexist as much as they can with their environment. So Kippic living outside of their environment, if they're staying true to the Kippic culture, I think are going to be using a lot of of their own architecture, but may also be adapting the architecture of other tribes that live in those environments in such a way as that they don't impact the environment. You know, because a lot of other tribes, because they're uh, learn, they know how to live amongst their environment the best they can. Uh, if it's a, an architectural style that tends to not disrupt the environment, that's what the Kippig are going to do because that's that's what's going to make sense in that environment. Yeah, but if, if that ends up being something that um, Kippig players really want to explore further, like again, our research mechanics are, are a way to potentially add in, even if it's not done at launch or something that can happen at launch, it's something that can be added to the game later on based on the choices that the players right. are making. 
I love the culture of the tribes and the player's ability to change that culture. Right. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about the cultural tribes of the tribes. Cultural tribe. The tribes of the culture. My cold. God, my head's so fuzzy. <laughs> um, we talk about the different cultures of the tribes, and um, we we think about them and communicate them as they are. You know, as they will be on launch day. Yeah. Um, but it's always important to remember that players have the ability to change those cultures. It'll be painful in some cases uh, because the NPCs are going to resist those changes as well as some other players because you know one of the things I love about this game and this community is that people have really embraced the tribes, embraced the cultures, and they respect them and they they identify with them. And so if you you know become a Kipic and your first mission is to go around trying to to kill all life in the forest, uh, I mean the NPCs will certainly fight against you to do that, but um, other players I think will also resist that change. That doesn't mean it can't be changed. Uh, certainly, I think some tribes are more prone to change than others. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm very excited to see how the players choose to yeah. change those tribes. If the collective majority decides that they want to go a different direction, right. they, they're they entitled to and able to Right, they have the to power to make forward. that happen. Yeah. I, I still think there's a small group of people that tra- plan to take the kipping and turn them into like critters. Like these like small, <laughs> scary, eat everything kind of a tribe. That's kind of terrifying. The pygmies yeah. from like Diablo three. Totally, like, I totally see that happening. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on to our next question. Uh, Atlas Forgiven says, when a part of a university and researching technology, does a scholar have to be on campus, or can they be in their own place outside of university grounds, like maybe in a research station? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we don't know yet. Um, we we have a general plan on how this stuff is going to work. As you join a group um, and you begin a group research, the general idea is that any of the research that you do as a part of that group, no matter where you do it, would apply towards that project. However, we do have some concerns about uh, informational security, for lack of a better word, uh, and so that might change. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to like set anything in stone right now. I, I just don't feel comfortable doing so. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a couple things with the mechanics. The the schools themselves obviously benefit from having specific versions of the crafting stations and things like that that are designed to encourage, you know, rapid research. Uh, but then also, you know, there's a big tie in there with the knowledge system because you know really research and and the goal is to gather a lot of knowledge and then contribute it. So it it's probably like if you're on school grounds or if you're at the university or you're doing research there, then not only do you get the benefit of gaining more of that knowledge, uh, but if you're off campus, then you can still do the research on your own, but then you have an opportunity to take what's learned, you know, as uh, some abstract representation of knowledge gained and contribute that back to the larger university, something right. like that. So. Right. The, the communication mechanics are going to make um, researching in the same location easier. Right. But it doesn't mean that you can't research on your own or elsewhere or just solo it you right. know like but it's going to be a lot harder well and with the knowledge system the way it tracks events is anytime somebody uses a skill or there's kind of other things so if you're using a research sta- station and you're using a skill at you know doing research if you're by yourself you know then you're accumulating those research points and you're accumulating that knowledge but if there's other people in the room around you then they're also getting notified and they're observing and witnessing that research that you're doing so it's almost multiplicative in that sense so there's just kind of an inherent advantage to doing that within proximity of a large number of people right. as opposed to doing it on your own so i mean we could utilize that as well right. all right cool uh scuttle asks how much overlap will there be in professional skills, and how effective would multidisciplinary collaboration be? For example, an alchemy guild collaborating with the metallurgy guild to research transmutation. Uh, so, more broadly, uh, expect multidisciplinary uh, collaboration to be necessary for the completion of many advanced sort of crafting goals or, or projects. Um, that would apply to research in some cases as well, too. Like you're you're very likely not going to invent, you know. Kipic spaceships in your garage all alone. It's just not going to happen. Um, she just, opened that can of worms. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Kipic space, hashtag Kipic spaceships. Yeah. Um, so expect it to be fruitful. Um, like, honestly, we're literally building the game to make that sort of a key component of the social interplay. Um, right. Whether you're, you know, whether you want to be a crafter or an adventurer or, or a politician, you're always going to have to depend on people from the other spheres of, of sort of um, uh, specialization around you. Um, uh, you know, a really good example of that is Toresque Armor. Uh, 
you can't make Toresque armor alone really effectively because all of the skills necessary in the chain that produces everything you need to, to do to assemble uh, Toresque armor crosses three distinct and relatively far apart um, trade skills. Yeah. Uh, so it's really unlikely that any one person would know all of the skills necessary. And even if they did know all of them, I mean, that's not the only equity here, right? There's also time. Right. Because a lot of those things can be done faster in parallel by making a sword. Sure, I might specialize as a swords maker. So I, I learned to make handles you know, out of wood or pommels and you know, out of metal and then the blades. And so I could, as a weaponsmith, actually go out and learn all the skills necessary to construct a blade and you know, fully wrap it with leather and everything like that. But uh, there's still this kind of intrinsic motivation to not do that because I can produce stuff faster if I have people who are doing each of those things and right. combine the product at the end. Uh, and so from a manufacturing standpoint, it also makes sense to have people working in parallel on those yeah, things. Yeah, get the wrapping and the scabbard from the leather worker, get right. the, right. you know, any wood pieces that you need from a carpenter. carpenter. the blade from a right. metalsmith. And yeah. We're, yeah. we're definitely a, you know, jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none style system wherein the broader you set your skills, the, the shallower your advancement in any one individual skill is going to be. So not only is it faster to get your components from the people who are specialized in making them, but they will be higher quality components in general. Yeah. Yeah. As in real life, it's who you know. <laughs> right, exactly. This is not a single player game, guys. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's also worth noting that the, uh, the amount of professional skills, there's so many different combinations that you can make with that, that the different types of specialties are going to be, you know, kind of almost endless. There's going to be certain certain things that people are used to that they know that work, but people can get experimental and try combining different skills to see if they can find something else that they want to do. Pop quiz for you, Vi. Mm. You are currently working on world generation mm -hmm. right now for domain and settlement selection, because yeah. I know you are building out all the maps of settlements. And one of the things that you're having to do is to get a good idea or a general sense of what the distribution of professions are yes. within any given settlement so that you have some way to convey to the, to the players really what the settlement's area of focus is and stuff like that. So as a quiz, uh, you were looking at various professions that could be replicated using the skills and other mechanics of COE. Off the top of your head, how many valid professions do you think you have found? 127. 127 different professions. That's either a combination of the skills that they use, the tools that they use, um, the materials that they use, the locations that they do their jobs, like a clerk is going to need to be at a building with a desk, <laughs> not like in a place that, you know, you're just standing around in right. a field or something like that. You could have a portable desk. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a, a different collection of, like, you know, the stations they use, the tools they use, the skills they have, or the locations that they do those jobs. That, um, and also kind of whether they're doing them in a civil, you know, civic capacity, a commercial capacity, uh, or gladiatorial or political capacity. So, like, the same thing, like a teacher, somebody who teaches in a civic capacity could be something like a, you know, a primary education teacher versus in a commercial capacity might be a university where they're actually they're getting paid a good salary right. in order to you know, do higher education. Or in a gladiatorial sense, a teacher is going to be teaching combat, so they're more of a, a you know, drill sergeant. Yeah, or sensei or something. Exactly, yeah. or sensei. And then in a political capacity, you know, a teacher could be somebody who is a, an advisor. Right. So it's... There's, a ton of different, even within that list of 127, there are different dimensions of each one, right. the different flavors that people can can have. Really, you know, when we say that this is a role-playing game, we mean a true role-playing game where you can choose the role that you want to play in society. It's not something that we have predefined. The list of 127 things that she's come up with are from looking at the different skills, as she said, and kind of mapping them to what would be a valid, you know, worthwhile, useful occupation in the world. But uh, that doesn't mean you can't mix and match those in order to create your own definition right. of what kind of role you have. So, yeah. you know, you might be a Fletcher, but you might also be a Ranger. So now you've got this own unique thing that you've created as somebody who, you know, is a hunter, hunter gatherer type who just right. kind of makes all their own stuff. You're a survivalist. And that's not necessarily a role that we've defined as one of the occupations. Uh, it's just those things that we feel like are good, discreet examples. But, you know, you can. I say mix and match them, but I don't. I don't even want to put really any kind of pressure or any kind of categorization on those. Is to say these are somehow things you choose. You, you. It's a fully skill based system, so you can be anything you it's want. What you do. It's what you do. <laughs> these are just the things that, for example, NPCs might categorize themselves as. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, chat points out that we, we did miss the 128th profession, Kip and Castor not, so. oh. It's not going to happen. That's what she said. It's not going to happen. I have that on, on a stream that you said that. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Sev asks, what will you do to enhance the exploration discovery of Illyria? Oh, God. Discovery is about the curated, created spaces, tailor-made to enhance my experience, full of micro details that I can notice. It's a long question, man. And memorize rather than just vast swaths of procedural generation. Uh, while beautiful, that stuff just fades into memory. Uh, beautiful vistas are not discoveries. I failed on that page turn. When I printed that out, I really should have put that paragraph all on one page. That's all good. Uh, so I guess I kind of want to start answering this one. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I just start. No, to I, I I laughed at that one because I reviewed this one with you briefly, and I I knew he had uh, Snipe has 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 feelings about this. I one, have so an opinion. Let's go. Yeah. Let's talk about your opinion. Um, yeah, I kind of uh, you know, and I mean no disrespect, Seth, but I, I kind of reject the premise of this question entirely. I do totally understand what you're experiencing when you describe this. Uh, Darkfall was a really good example. Darkfall was an incredibly large world, but because it was procedurally generated and there wasn't sort of any uh, any attention to detail in that generation, you would end up with like literally square kilometers that were flat with grass on them, right? right. Um, and that's, that's absolutely not fun, and I totally agree with that. Um, however, I would like to point out that the planet you live on now is procedurally generated. It is not curated. It has been curated since it was generated by its players. Does that sound familiar? That's that's Illyria. That's what we're doing. Um, right, but we're going a little bit further in that because Illyria has been lived in for a while before you all move in, um, we are including points of interest. Precisely. And that's part of our procedural algorithms is to include points of interest. And they could be anywhere from a bandit camp to a pond to a, a labyrinth or something like oh, a lost vault, perhaps. Yeah, lost vault. Like there, there are ones that are going to be relatively common. Um, you know, like a fallen tree, and then there are going to be some that are going to be exceptionally rare. And so, it we're going to be putting a lot of those things out into the world. But then further, players are going to be able to create their own new places once the game is live that can become new points of interest for other players. Right, and to that point, if there was a square kilometer of flat plains that was just grass in Illyria, come back in a year. I mean, an Illyrian year, right? right? right. It might have something else there because you players are out there changing the world. The whole point is that the world evolves based on what you do. Right, it might be overrun with deer or it might be turned into a farm or something right like somebody may have built a lone tower out in the middle of nowhere yeah like that it, it's all possible and that's the whole kind of point is that the world the world is not going to be static in fact the same piece of ground that you found boring and unattractive the first time around may actually end up being your favorite space the next time you come across it just because of what's happened to it since yeah and that's important for the cartography system as well because the world is going to be changing and evolving and the points of interest are going to be many of them undiscovered at launch and so people are going to need to go out and find those things and then convey them through their maps like hey there's this like crazy broken tree uh, over here and if you turn left at that then you'll find this amazing waterfall or you know a something like a new town that has no roads to it i uh i'll weigh in uh i have to say first that i i, I understand what Seb is saying like you yeah um when we discussed this earlier, and I used an analogy, we, we had a like pre-conversation pre discussion on this. Um, you know, I used music as kind of an analogy. You know, when we procedurally generate the world, it's a lot like, you know, putting music or putting sound, putting notes throughout the world. Um, and if it's too uniform, if it's just kind of constant note everywhere, it starts to become very pedal tone, you know, and, and you kind of lose the melody. Um, the melody is really only valid. It's only, uh, like, noticeable, discernible when there are periods of... Of, of silence or rest and so it's the the difference between those it's the range of like lack of information to positive information right, the contrast the contrast, the contrast is really what makes it look interesting and unique uh, and so you know when we procedurally generate the world even if we were to procedurally generate a world where every parcel of land is interesting and unique and stuff like that it's really just gonna all blend in together at some point and so you can't you do need that contrast in order to help the player understand that this is interesting, it's new and it's different. Um, but at the same time, I also have to agree with the two of you that 
that I think really discovery and exploration is not about going someplace for the first time and seeing something that uh, you've never seen before and having it be interesting and exciting. Uh, I think from a game perspective, discovery and exploration comes from this fundamental understanding that you never know what you're going to find, even if it's someplace you've been before. And an example I will give is, is you know, even back to the earliest days of our world generation when we were in the COE client and we had generated 4K by 4K areas, we, we really had only a minimal number of creatures in the world. You know, we didn't have a lot of the early gameplay mechanics, so there wasn't combat or anything like that. And yet, we found that a large percentage of the studio would jump into that procedurally generated world and just go off in a random direction. We knew that there wasn't going to be any buildings, no settlements or anything like that that, that we would encounter. And yet, we knew that it was interesting and exciting for its own way, or its own right because we, we didn't know what was going to be there. But I think we all were very excited about that idea of the next time I go back there, you know, there could be something different there. You know, it could be a completely kind of evolving world. So, I mean, I guess there's there's two halves of that. One is, you know, in a procedurally generated world like this, you really don't know what you're going to find anywhere. And it's a big world. So, you know, even we don't necessarily know what's going to show up in some of these places. But furthermore, because it's a living world, even once you've been someplace, the excitement and discovery and exploration comes from knowing that the next time it might be different. Well, plus the needs of the inhabitants are going to change. So... While you might wander through the woods at one point and see nothing of particular interest, um, you know, maybe then later somebody is sick and they need a special herb and they think that it grows in that forest. And mm -hmm. now you're going through that same place that was boring, looking for a tiny flower, uh, you know, and or it could be that, you know, an explorer who goes through there and surveys the area finds that there's actually silver, in, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the water. And so there's a vein somewhere and right. so now like a silver rush goes on trying to get that extract that material there are resources that players have to find it's not just a thing that shows up on your map that you interact with and mine and then it's it's gone and then it reappears in another random place like this right. is not that game yep. um, you guys are going to have to find the resources that you want and the needs of the players are going to drive what is what is an thing of importance out in the wilderness sure all right all right. Take a look at that Next question. Uh, Malvorn asks, in terms of your average player in COE, what are the multiple levels of calls, of calls to arms that can be applied to you? Snap graciously said on Discord that CTA clauses can be applied to land deeds. I should probably explain that part first. Yeah. Uh, land deeds aren't like... There isn't, a, there isn't a place on the land deed where you, you would put a CTA clause. Rather, instead, you would sign a contract to pass ownership rights of that parcel over, and it's in that contract where you would have some sort of clause that says, if the Lord needs to muster troops, then you must report for service, and if you don't, these are the penalties for failing to do so. I think there's a group that's trying to get all the counts to take over ownership or the ability to do call to arms. Basically, they want to be able to govern their own militias inside yeah. the counties. Yeah, yeah. and I, I totally understand why yeah. you want to. I mean, Cool. Uh, and the contract system will let you do that kind of thing. But uh, again, it's not directly attached to the deed. Those are different mechanics. It's just that you can use one to execute the other and thus effectively get what you're asking for. Yeah. Um, as far as like multiple levels of calls to arms, that depends on how you define the contract. So there, contracts will have clauses and you can fill out the specific details <laughs> in those clauses to sort of create your contracts, right? So it'll be up to you to creatively select your clauses and fill them with the right conditions mm -hmm. to satisfy whatever level of call to arms you're looking to, to accomplish. So basically what you're saying is, is if the Duke and the Count both have contracts with somebody to do a call to arms and they call both call at the same time, which one you actually honor is really about which one has the worst remuneration. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Mm, contract system, that would be a good design journal to do in the near future. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that's that question, so let's move on to the next one. Cool. Uh, regarding contract mechanics. Oh, wow. <laughs> Will the consequences of not fulfilling or breaking a contract be administered by world mechanics or the players? The players. If the former, what kind of consequence can we expect? If the latter, how will players be able to tell if the contract has been broken? So, uh, this actually kind of goes back to what I was just talking about. When you define a contract, you lay out the conditions that, that satisfy that contract. Uh, when those decision, those uh, conditions are broken, then you can consider the contract in breach and declare it in breach. That would then give you the right to enact whatever agreed upon remuneration or penalty was, was defined in the contract. 
that might be I have the right to see some amount of property or, or, or coinage from you of something like that, um, which would effectively just give you the ability to repossess it without worrying too much about criminal consequences. Um, it might be I then get the right to issue a bounty token, in which case that contract can then be taken to whoever issues bounty tokens, and then your token can be issued based on the fact that that contract is in breach. A new contract gets made right. with a bounty. Exactly, exactly. Um, so the answer isn't that it's just systems or just players. The answer is players will use systems to enforce the terms of their contracts. I think it goes into the knowledge system a lot too, yeah. you know, to what you're saying. Knowing, having your character know that a contract is in breach. So observing, you know, I sign a contract that says this person will never attack this other person. If your character observes that happening, then your character now knows that there's right. a contract breach there. Right. And then you as the player can then have your character act on that. Right. If, if a, there's a contract that says, like, never pick this flower. Right. Or whatever. It's a very contrived. Poppies. Like, they're legal to pick in California. Yeah, that's true. Like, never pick this flower. And you go off in the woods and you're all alone. You find one. You pick it. And nobody sees you. Your contract isn't necessarily going to be something that somebody's going to come after you about. Right. Like, right. They'd have but, to prove it, basically. But right. if they find out, and if somebody observed you doing it, and they have evidence to the contrary, or they find the flower or something like that, you could then be held to the, uh, the consequences. So, yeah. Fun times. All right. Uh, we are at 159. Whoa. Okay. Uh, we probably have time for about one more question. Cool. That's uh, partially up to the community. What's our uh, viewing count like? Uh, what do our viewers want? Got any extra time? Questions are how many? How many questions do we have left on this page? Uh, there are like five more on this page. All right, yeah. they all want more. They all. Yeah. All right. Well, we want to keep it concise so that people can come back and watch it later on. But let's see if we can get through this page. All right. All right. So Sev asks, I understand why having players being imprisoned could cause serious gameplay problems, but what about NPCs? So, uh, part of the reason that I wanted to answer this question was to mention that we haven't really finalized how we're going to deal with uh, repeat offenders, how we're going to deal with uh, the kind of criminal element that you might need a prison for. Um, we've talked before about, you know, bounty tokens or, or losing maybe some amount of your, like, spirit when you died, or, um, when you were caught, and, and I say died because I assume you are executed, but when you were caught. Um, however, Part of the reason that we did that is exactly what you mentioned. We we have an issue with the idea of somebody else sort of taking control of your character and then just making it not fun to log into that character because why why would you log into that character anymore? Right. Um, Unless we made like the experience of being in prison exactly kind of interesting. Like in real life, you go into prison. All right, to steal your thunder, but like in real life, you go into prison and it's a whole different world, <laughs> and many people come out different with different skills. For, for better or for worse, with different networks of people that they know, for better or for worse. Um, and that can be a, a whole gameplay experience. And so it's not just about like, oh, I'm stuck in a cell and I can't do anything. It's like, there's now new stories that could be told, but we need to really um, put some very careful thought into what it is. Because once you do, in a game, like take somebody's agency away, it feels really bad it feels worse than in real life right when your agency is taken away right i mean from like a a purely you know thought experiment standpoint i would argue that most people play games to sort of maintain their control over things right that that, that part of what especially role-playing game right yeah. is like a sort of like wish fulfillment we can do the things that that real life doesn't make possible for us and we have that kind of control um so we're very shy about about curtailing that but just as Vi was saying, it doesn't mean that there isn't a way to make prisons or something like them work. And so I wouldn't say that we're completely ruling that out. That's still uh, on the table, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, it's been on the table for a while because there's this inherent dichotomy, right? Because normally jail, prison, things like that are typically seen as punitive. They could be rehabilitative. That's, I mean, that kind of, not to get political, but, you know, there is a difference between whether or not we view those things as punitive versus rehabilitative. Absolutely. But if you look at them as punitive, they're they're intentionally designed to be a bad experience for people who are put into those circumstances. But when you're making a game, 
even when you're trying to change a player's behavior, when you're trying to punish them, it still has to be an enjoyable process. Uh, otherwise, they just simply opt out of playing. And right. That's not. We never want to discourage play of the game because that's not a great mechanic. No. <laughs> um, good so, us. but I mean, that's where that dichotomy comes from, and that's that's why it's, this takes so much time and energy and thought. And criminal justice system plays into the contract system. It plays into you know building and design and architecture, settlement management. Like it's not a standalone thing where we could just say, yeah, sure, let's do prisons, and then we'll go from there. I mean, other games have tried to do prisons to varying levels of success, and I think this is one of the like top five systems, I think, that really requires we nail it. Uh, and that's why we've been hesitant to commit to any one particular solution exactly. yet. But, well, as a game you know. feature, it's really more of a question of sociology and psychology than it is mechanics. Perfect. So, I love it. Right. So, I mean, we're, we're, we want to do it, and we want to figure out what is the right solution, but uh, we haven't Right. Yet. Cool. Um, yeah, well, one other question, though, piece of it was like, yeah. could NPCs and players have different stuff? Ultimately, we want NPCs and players to have exactly. um, a parity between the experiences that they can have. So there's never going to be, quote me on this, <laughs> uh, there's never going to be something that players can do that NPCs can, or that NPCs can do that players can. Exactly. So the answer is, yeah, if we do yeah, have... There's a stake in the ground. Quote me on right. that. <laughs> this was the uh, Q&A that you guys did on uh, March 27th, yeah, okay. and exactly. she said in that one that we would yeah. never... At that exactly is our, that is our hour, intention. Right. Yeah. At exactly 204, if I committed to never having that. Yeah. That's our intention for the game, obviously. <laughs> there's there's even exceptions that I can think of even sure. now. Like, you know, we're going to potentially... But tribal, encourage... tribal culture stuff. like that well, we... Yeah, like yeah. we're going to encourage NPCs to, like... Uh, begin quests right. for another player who's triggered their um, you know personal destiny. Their personal destiny and stuff right. like that. And that is not something that we're going to do to online characters. Right. I think it comes down to the user experience versus the mechanics. We want the mechanics for the two to be different, but the user experience should be the same. Right. From from the perspective of an NPC and the perspective of a character, a player character, it's the same world. You know, the same rules apply to both of them. Whether or not we use NPCs to drive gameplay mechanics is kind of Ignore the man behind the curtain, <laughs> right, sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the next question comes from Eric Wright, uh, and Eric says, "If PvP is available everywhere, is it possible for someone to just kill all the NPCs in a town? There will always be people like that, and make it empty and useless. Do you have a way to prevent it? Well, actually, one of the things that we Several. can, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we can we can hit on is actually uh, that stake that we just put in the ground there. Um, from the player experience standpoint." what happens to players should, should at least seem to happen to NPCs. Which means, while NPCs may die more easily than a player, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that their first time dying is their last time dying. Um, they could potentially come back just like players can. Um, and so, it will be relatively as hard to clear out an area of NPCs as it will be to clear out an area of, of PCs or OPCs. Um, so it's not going to be a simple like one shot raid, um, which already changes the logistics of this kind of behavior for Zerg rushers. Uh, but then there are other things as well. I mean, we have, you know, systems for NPCs and players to be able to raise alarms and muster support when they're in cities and cities are generally safer because there are people who can help respond to, to problems when they see them. And so and uh, it's probably illegal. Yeah. Precisely. And it's, it's exactly. It's, so it's while you might very be able, likely illegal. Well, you might be able to do it, like even if you were able to make sure that it was a town where all the NPCs, or it was all NPCs, there was no players, and they were all going to die if you, you know, permadie if you incapacitated them all. You're able to do that. Um, you're still going to potentially have people come after you for that because that's not a popular thing to do. Right. Um, the world is going to know about that. Like, if there were, you know, were any witnesses or your reputation gets around, you were talking about it and people overhear that and they share that information, like that could come back to haunt you. So even if you can do it, the, ga the, the experience is not necessarily over at that point. And sure, you can go in, you know, to a place on earth and you can wipe everything out. And that's like a shitty experience. And most of the world doesn't like that. I wouldn't encourage that behavior. No. no. And well, in fact, just, in just fact saying, we actively discourage right, that behavior. Right. But is it possible? It is possible. Is it going to be common? Probably not. God, I hope not. After, after people shake out 
Like, I think there's probably going to be a lot more, like, attempted genocides early on in the game. Right. Because people treat Chronicles of Valyria like every other game. But then they'll soon realize, I hope, that there are consequences, social and um, financial, like, economical, to some of the choices that they're trying to make and some of the destructive behaviors that they're doing. Right. We don't want to say that destructive behavior is not allowed. What the fuck was that? I think you, did you have an earring on? I did have an earring on. I think you just lost your earring. Yeah, cool. Um, destructive behavior is allowed, but it's not going to be the norm. Right. I think the other thing, too, is reminder, the last thing, is that it's a skill-based combat system, too. Uh, and anytime you incorporate a skill-based system into a game like this, it increases the risk-reward graph dramatically uh, because the number of people who could just walk into a settlement and annihilate everybody, uh, that number goes down very rapidly. Right. Uh, so I, I think people often assume also that it's going to be fairly easy to do that. But just like the players have varying levels of skill, so too do the NPCs. You know, So there will be NPC guards and others that have the ability to fight themselves, in many cases just as good as, if not better, than a lot of the players because they don't have latency and things like that. Right. So. I would say it, it's worth noting in, in AI design that one of the problems that designers have when building AI is actually Dumbing them down. AI not so smart that it can kill you instantly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and and mo- a lot of MMOs, the zones are specifically curated for players to go in and kill all those things and be successful at it. It might take you know crowd control or certain tactics. Um, those those types of things are not going to exist right. in Illyria. Like you can go into a town and they're potentially prepared to defend themselves, yeah. um, even if. You manage to kill like you know a couple guards on the outside. Once people start witnessing what you're doing, they're going to do something about it. They'll either flee if that's the best choice, and you won't necessarily be able to catch all of them, or they'll you know come together and try to stop you. And it's not going to be like where you're just going to cast sleep on an area and uh, then kill each <laughs> each NPC one by one. Right. Um, you are going to be overwhelmed, and even if you're an amazing combatant, uh, you are going to be overwhelmed by numbers. It's yeah. just a fact. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, next question from Turgon. Uh, during which season and tide are... Oh, that's an interesting question. During which season and tide are the current maps generated, since both would affect playable landmass, especially in Salt and Freshwater Marsh? Probably a Spring Equinox. Yeah. Yeah. I think we want an equinox so that we don't have to worry about too high extremes on either end. And I prefer spring rather than fall just because the colors that we're using right now are not necessarily fall colors. So I think for us, from a map generation standpoint and from a world generation standpoint, that spring equinox is probably the easiest. Yeah. Good question. That is a good question, right? Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, Flynn Pontus says, will a shared language be necessary for someone to teach another character any kind of skill or technique? Mm. Uh, Short answer, yes. Long answer, it actually depends on what's trying to be taught. I can physically teach you how to use a sword technique without us having to have a language uh, conversation. On the other hand, there are other things that I just couldn't teach you without words. And so, depending on what is being taught, uh, the ability to communicate will matter. A lot of the mechanics are divided between the techniques and knowledge. That's one thing that you'll hear us iterate on a lot. So, you know, when it comes to like crafting, there are the techniques you use to actually craft, uh, and then there's the knowledge about the resources and materials and things like that that you are working on that contributes to your chance of success and what things you can actually craft and stuff like that. So, in that environment, you know, you might be able to teach somebody the techniques. Um, but you would not be able to, to pass that knowledge on to them. So they would still be missing, at the very least, the knowledge associated with what they're trying to do. Thanks. All right, uh, last question on the page. Cool. Uh, this is from Norin, who says, the size of a parcel of land is 64 by 64 by 64 meters. Um, 64 meters cubed. Uh, for most slash all tribes. It's for all tribes, all for, tribes. for the record. Uh, with a parcel extending 32 meters above and 32 meters below the surface. So when buying a parcel of land, it is quite clear what to expect in most biomes. Can you tell us a bit more about how that system will work out for the kippic? What does a parcel of kippic land or a parcel of an ironwood tree look like? What and how would we probably build on above or below it? Um, So, uh, this is actually uh, a problem that we've been discussing (coughs) off and on now for, gosh, a little over a year, I think. 
So the answer is that because parcels are in 3D space, uh, some parcels won't be on the ground. Um, they might be above the ground uh, for Kippic settlements, for example, or they might be below the ground for uh, Hrothi delvings. Um, and anybody else who wanted to dig a mine or something, I suppose. Uh, so the answer really depends on where you're buying the parcel. But so, for example, if you were to buy a, a, a Kippic parcel on an ironwood tree, you would probably consider the shelf or branch or or uh, fungus that's there as the sort of ground level, and then you would have 32 meters below it and 32 meters above it. Um, likewise, in a in a Rothy delving, uh, you will always be on that middle ground plane as you're walking through whatever it is that you're excavating. Um, so when you occupy a parcel, if it's it's got to be accessible before you can occupy it, first of all. But assuming that it's accessible, its ground plane will be at the same level that the connecting parcel's accessibility is at. Um, and so it's 32 meters above, 32 meters below. Just imagine that the entire world is sort of set up in a, in a like, three-dimensional grid of these 64-meter cubed parcels. That's, that's the world. Yeah. It's probably important to note, too, that that's not dynamic. So uh, to, what, to what Snipe was saying, it's important to understand that you know, if you're going up or down, uh, the, the units of measurement are fixed like they are horizontally in terms of a projection. So if a hill is going up on a slope, uh, it's 64 meters across if you were to flatten it. It's not that because you're moving uphill you get to go far, further because it's 64 meters you know, linearly as the, as the crow flies along the edge. You, you know, it's projective. Um, the same thing has to happen vertically. So uh, really what it means is, is that there is a grid of 64 by 64 meters of the entire world and if you you know, were to step up, let's say, to the next mushroom, and that was to cross the boundary into another 64 uh, meter tall area, and you were to claim that area, then it's not necessarily that you're going to get 64, 32 meters below and above. It would be that yours would be from there and then 64 meters up, because that's where that block of 64 meters right. is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, about claiming, and that also means that some parcels in the air are, are more valuable than others because if you've got one where there's you know no branches for that entire 64 meter period of time then probably nobody's going to want to claim that parcel it's, right, well, it's, it's largely it's useless yeah. or it's a cliff you know yeah. it's the same thing if i buy a parcel of land on the surface and there is a you know a large chasm in the middle of it or something like that you know it might make it so that there's less usable space the same thing has to happen vertically and then there can, there can be less vertical space so that's usable so you want to make sure you, you find an area where there is a lot of vertical space and then the same thing goes for below ground as well so you know the world will be divided up into 32 meter 64 meter sections going below the ground as well and it could be that the tunnel you've you've dug through actually is the, at the top of that 64 meter area in which case you really own that and 64 meters below it could be that it's going through the middle in which case you own a, above and below right um sea level is kind of at like the basis for one of those 64 meters so we, we count those 64 meters up and down from sea level so for a lot of the country or for a lot of the world up in the northern continent uh, a lot of that's already going to be positive, you know, in six, those 64 elevation. meters because of the higher elevation. And so you will find that, especially in the, in the Harathi area and stuff like that, that really you're working your way down towards zero. You know, it's, it's a positive number to begin exactly. with. Yeah. Uh, it's also important to note that the parcels that you can have need to have some sort of physical medium that they can be reached by. There's no buying parcels in that are fully in the air right there needs to be a way to get there right now if you started building a tower and you got to a, you could get the next parcel up but there does need to be a, a path right they have to be accessible accessible yeah, yeah. Uh, cool that's the page. nailed it I mean, we're a little after, but uh, we're good. Uh, all right, guys. We did start a little late. We did start a little late. Yeah. All right, all right guys. Well, uh, this, like I said, just as a capstone on this, this is our first live Q&A for 2019. It will not be our last one. We've yeah, got we lots of other plans. Kick uh, it up a little bit more again. We always do one at the beginning and end of our, or I guess at the end of our, our uh, releases. Uh, we are... Uh, are working our way through 050. Once that ends, we'll definitely be following up with another live Q&A on really all the stuff that we've done in 050. Uh, you can expect a live stream play of that, not just a QA. and a you know, We really want to get in and actually show you guys what we've been working on. So at some point, there will be a live stream of us actually playing through uh, Chronicles of Valyria in our 050 release. And then as we move on to 060 and talk about uh, really what's going to ship in the pre-alpha and, and all that stuff like that, you'll no doubt get another live Q&A from us and anything else that comes up that warrants a live Q&A. So um, 
Last bit of reminder, uh, we do have our promo going online. Make sure to head over to the forums if you haven't. Check out the website. Check out those uh, promos. Make sure you're recruiting your friends. Select your server. Select your server. Uh, <laughs> make sure you're recruiting your friends to join you in, in your county. Uh, get those mayors. And uh, anything else I'm missing? Claim your packages. Send, your packages. send extra Transfer your titles. stuff to, yeah, send extra titles to friends before settlement and domain selection lands because that's going to be. Right. Yeah, big. Right. And. No takesy backsies. And from me to you, after having no less than half a dozen people come to me and tell me this, how? Battle Cat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's all for you, buddy. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for uh, checking this out and hope you enjoyed this live Q&A. Um, we will, as usual, be back in our Discord server, official Discord server, uh, on a regular basis. So if you didn't get a chance to have your question answered here, uh, you know, we didn't get a chance to, to kind of take it to live questions like we would normally because we had so many great questions to ask. Uh, but we are always, uh, some number of us, our moderators, our ambassadors, or the developers themselves are in our Discord server uh, paying attention and listening to what's going on. So if you'd like an opportunity to chat with us directly, make sure you're checking out the official Discord at uh, discord.gg slash chroniclesofvaleria. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.